Hello, everyone. My name is Annalisa Adams Quatier, and I'm part of the Skoll Foundation team. I'm excited to welcome you to this session Against Forgetting Historical Memory and Just Reconciliation. This year, the forum's theme is Closing the Distance, and we thought of no better way to reflect that theme than to invite our global network to design and build a new kind of experience for you. Before we get started, there's a couple of things I'd like to go over. First, this session is being recorded and will be released publicly after the event. Next, please use the chat to kind of engage with one another and also ask questions of our speaker. We estimate this is gonna run about 60 minutes long, but then after that, take a moment to complete the single question feedback survey question that we have for you. And you can do that in the poll tab. That's to the right of your video screen. On social media, we're using the hashtag SkullWF and we'd love for you to engage with us on that. And so please do the same. We're so thrilled to be able to include this session in this year's forum. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to your session host, Lindy, Lindsay Spindle, president of the Jeff Skoll Group. Thanks, Annalisa. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on where you're joining us from. We're so happy to have you be a part of this session at the Skoll World Forum. As Annalisa mentioned, the session is called Against Forgetting, Historical Memory and Just Reconciliation. And I have to tell you, I think you are in for a treat because you are about to hear from some incredible, incredible people. I wanna thank my colleague, Jimmy Briggs at the Skull Foundation for partnering with me to put this session together and all of our guests who have joined us. I'm not gonna read through everyone's bios in the interest of time. They're all on the forum website. I do encourage you to read more about these wonderful people after the session is done, if you haven't already. Um, and before we get into our conversations, we're gonna listen to a short video first. James, will you start the first video, please? How do you try to get into the mind of a 12, 13 year old in that situation? After these many years, why did you want to tell us your story? You know, pretty soon there won't be any more survivors. And frankly, my youngest son kept at me until I agreed. The religion was a very major reason why these people took the risk. It's my brother and sister. Lift it up a little more. Oh, wow. <laughs> so my concept was structured on giving all people human rights. It was a term which didn't exist when I started. My grandfather, he didn't blame the German people. And he said, you can't you can't even begin to heal your own wounds if you go down that path, right? Because that path only very leads insightful. to that only leads to hatred. So I'm very proud that this is could be a vehicle where groups can come together and learn about each other. What you did is a wonderful work you're doing, and. Uh, Hopefully you'll continue doing it for a long time to come, as long as you find people who can talk about it, you know, which I was lucky enough to do. Thank you for that. You just listened to stories of participants from the Last Chance Testimony Project at the Shoah Foundation. Uh, it's an effort to try to capture testimonies from some of the remaining Holocaust survivors among us. 
and you are about to meet one of them. Jeanette Spiegel is joining us from New York today, and at 97 years old, she has many identities. She's an Austrian-born Holocaust survivor. She is a rare escapee from an infamous Nazi death march. She's an immigrant turned US citizen. She's a successful saleswoman, a mother, a grandmother, a wife, and a great grandmother. Uh, Jeanette and I have a lot in common besides our lineage. We share a love for family and chocolate, although she loves milk chocolate and I love dark chocolate. We'll forgive her. And she's a cat person and I'm a dog person. But uh, Jeanette has stories and wisdom and advice that could fill hours. Um, so we'll do our best to just pull a few things out that are about the power of preserving memory and the role that historical memory plays in justice and reconciliation. Um, Jeanette and I spent some time together last weekend and there's one thing she told me that I have not forgotten since we met. She said to me, you can't take away what's in my head. I beat Hitler. You wanna wipe out my family, I'll show you. And with that, let me introduce Jeanette, who can indeed show all of us something about perseverance. Hi, Jeanette. Hi. Hi, and Jeanette is joined with her by her daughter, Heidi, who is going to join us as well. Jeanette, I thought we would start and talk a little bit about your childhood. Maybe you could tell us where you grew up, um, when you were forced to leave, and at what age uh, you were put into a concentration camp. Well, I was born in Vienna, Austria, and in 1923, so that makes me 97 years old, <laughs> pretty old, but I remember many things, many happy things from when I was a little girl, when I was with my parents, and I had a sister, which I admired, and I was jealous of her. She was three years older, and she was very bright, very smart. And she went one of the very, very special schools. And... Uh, where, the, where she had Latin and started off with Latin, Old Greek, uh, all these uh, things. I wasn't good enough for this, <laughs> but no. Jeanette, how old were you when you first left Vienna? What was that? When you left Vienna, how old were you when you went on the child transport? I left in uh, 38, uh, 38 to Belgium. There was a choice to go to England or to Belgium. I, I went to Belgium because my mother's sister lived there and my mother felt better if I gonna go to her sister. Had I gone to England, I wouldn't have had all this miserable years. So but you told me when you, you told me no, that you spent the oh, best for me. Yeah, you, you told me you spent several years in Belgium and uh, for a long time with many kind people uh, before you were sent to to Auschwitz. Could you tell us a little bit about your time I in Belgium? remember once that the Gestapo what came and I saw it and there came the electric uh, trolley and I jumped up on the trolley and I was very upset. I said, oh, the Gestapo is after me. And there was a, st a stop where the trolley would have stopped. And all the people said, let's go on, let's go on, don't stop. Even the people who had to get off. 
And I find that very, very nice. Jeanette, how old were you when you went to Auschwitz? I went to Auschwitz in 44, and I was 20. So you were you were much older than some children that went to Auschwitz. Is that because you spent time in Belgium? You were safe in Belgium for several years. Yeah. So you got, when you got to Auschwitz, you were older. So is that because of you know how you stayed safe in Belgium? But look at them, not yeah. me. <laughs> look at Lindsay. Oh yeah. It's and my parents were taken in 42. So I was lucky I was in Belgium and uh, we played cat and mouse. I used to run away. <laughs> oh my God, the Gestapo and the Belgium people were very nice to me. And there were many who, who hated the Germans they, not that they loved Jews, no, <laughs> but they hated the Germans more than they disliked the Jews. So yeah. they don't like the Jews and were nice. They have only good memories of Belgium. Yeah. Jeanette, we have people from all over the world here with us today, and many of them don't know many things and, and about inside of concentration camps. They've never met someone who survived before. So what would you like them to know about your experiences in Auschwitz? There were so many terrible things that I don't know where to start. But anyhow, when I came into the camp, we were, we were, so there was a doctor standing there and he said, right, left, right, left. And I went where he showed me and uh, all the ladies, all the women who had children went to another place. And then there were some talks and the, the woman with children could get onto the trucks. And there were some people who said, oh, I can't walk very much. And the German was very nice. He said, get on the truck. The truck went right into the gas chambers. But I felt I was young, I can walk, and I have no right to be up there. So. I didn't mind walking. We walked. Well, we walked into the camp and there was somebody, we had to be in quarantine There was, what was the, with the, with the doctor? Which one? The, the Polish doctor, but uh, there were so many things I don't even know, can remember. Yeah. But when the, the woman who had, well, with the children, they told us that we will make them inside the camp. And so there were many, many young people who said, where's my mother? Where's my little sister? And then there was some very funny smell in the, in the air. And then other inmates told me that that is where they burn, where they gas the people and then burn them. And it sounded so unbelievable 
that uh, I said, what do you mean the, the same route? I will not go. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't know. So first then we were in quarantine and after this, they send us to work to dry out. When did you get your tattoo? Oh, when I came in, yeah. They tattooed us and we have, I have a number. I don't know if that opens up. Seventy six six a little bit higher. There you go. Seventy six six fifty five. Um, remember, but it was lucky. I want the ones who didn't get numbers were the ones who were killed. So the number is something good, and some people later removed them when they, after the war but I would never do that. It was my lucky number. It's an amazing way to think about it. Um, so after you know, quarantine, they yeah. brought us in to work. Uh, to, I got into another barrack, and that was a black barrack, and we had to try to drive all the mud and what was on the floor, we had to do, take sto little stones and try to pave the floor. And it was very, and there were couples who watched us and it was, they were very happy. They, they, there were always two, two young person to carry them. And after, after this, oh, I, I don't know, I, I had a cut or what, and I went to the infirmary, and when I came out, my command was left. So I said, what should I do? And they said, go to them, go with them. That was already after I was some time there, and they went to the potato fields. And that was a very nice thing, because we had to dig potatoes. But when we came, they took all our possessions, and they gave us some old things to wear. And I had a blouse which had big, big sleeves. And I used to steal potatoes, raw potatoes. But I saw when I brought them into the camp that it wasn't so easy to cook them. There was uh, one of the girls was in charge of the heating system and she had a pot of water and she would boil your potato if you gave her one. So that means I had to bring two potatoes in. Then if I wanted to get a sink that I should wash because they didn't let me shower then. So I had to get a, a potato. So I had to bring three potatoes. <laughs> and whatever it was, it was, I tried to bring in as many potatoes as I could, but you couldn't be caught. If you were caught, they would beat you so... You avoided it. Yeah. Um, I worked on this, I worked on the street, I worked by the potatoes, and I probably, I don't know if I would have made it even though the potatoes were a pretty good job concerned against what was going on. But then one day we all had to stand 
I forgot to say something. When you came into the camp, they cut all your hair off, they shaved your head. But when my transport came in from Belgium, we all were left the hair because the, a red cross came in and we didn't understand, but they told us we had to stand in front and we still wore our clo own clothes. We hadn't given it up, we had hair. And they were saying, what are they talking? We don't cut the hair, we only cut the hair of the people who have lies. It wasn't true. So, but I remained with my hair and in the camp, if you had hair, everybody thought you were a very special person, <laughs> that you had a very good job. But I didn't have a very good job then. But once I was with the potatoes, I considered that a good job. But after I was there a few months, we all had to stand in line and Dr. Mengelis, I don't know if I told you about him, he was the one who selected who goes, who gonna live and who gonna die. And he was, he said he needed some people for a special job. Everybody says that job will be a good job, a good job. So we stood in line and I remember he, he picked some people and there were some couples who had some favorite and there were some four, four work about which had favorite but he picked some people and he, he said you and he pointed but I couldn't believe it was me so I turned around and they screamed at me you with the long hair <gasps> And I was so scared, I said, oh my God, that hair will get me killed. But instead we had to stand in line and then we went to something what they called Canada. And because they did not think that the United States was the best country, they thought Canada was the best country and it was the best job. So I was picked with the first 30 girls for the Canada. The Canada was that when you came into the camp, they took everything. At home they told you, pack up everything or you can take everything with you. So you took all your good stuff in the suitcase, you arrived there, they took it away. Yeah. So Canada then bought it for the people who had to open the suitcase and the sort uh, ch children clothes to children clothes and blouses to blouses, skirts to skirt. And uh, also they had to ask any jewelry, but if you found jewelry, they told you, your friends from the camp told you, if you can hide it, but don't be ever caught with jewelry because for this they want to kill you. That has to go to Germany, the jewelry. So I did find a ring with a tiny little stone and I said, how can I hide it? And so I thought of something. I asked, I went to the infirmary and I said that I had something. And they gave me a... A wristband. A wristband. A, not, not a wristband. Oh, to, to a band-aid. A band-aid. Band they gave me a band-aid. And I took the band-aid and I put it in the arch of my foot with the ring. And I, I had, I, I made a friend, I found a friend whom I knew from outside 
her name was Ruth. And I said to Ruth, we need that ring. Someday maybe we will escape. We, <laughs> we, it was impossible, but when I arrived, it was in April, there was, there was an escape. Uh, Walter something, later on called Rudy Vreba, he wrote a book about it. And I think they were the only ones who escaped. They were Czech, I think. Yes, Czech. And he and his friend escaped to go to the Pope to tell him what's going on. But that was Pius XII, I think. And... I don't think he did anything, uh, but he kept that. That is when people decided that there is such a thing like Auschwitz and that they kill, that they gas people and they kill all the children. And he made that famous. So what did Jeanette? you do? Ring. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's okay. No, I kept that that ring. I wanted to when I escape that maybe, but one day my friend Ruth had a friend who said that there came a transport of of some boys, I think, and she said the the German who who was taking them to, not to work, to the gas chambers maybe, that he will have him tattooed. They didn't get tattooed. He will have somebody tattooed, give the drink away. So I said, I can't keep a drink just to eat. If somebody's life can be saved with it. So I gave the drink away. Jeanette, uh, these are... Put a, 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 a loaf of bread, but a life is so much more worth than a loaf of bread that I could not have kept that. that I, I would have choked on it if I would have kept that. Yeah. Jeanette, um, we, um, we, we wish we could listen for hours. Your stories are are just amazing. I, I would like to ask one more quick question and then we're going to bring in the next speaker. Um, um, you, you're so generous telling your stories. Heidi told me when, when she was young, you would go to school yeah. and tell your story. You're telling your story now to people who live in a hundred different countries. Why do you think it's so important to keep telling your story? I think we have to avoid that that ever happen again, that a dictator, that I got scared when we had Trump because I, I feel everything here is so good. Four years for the government to have, and if he's no good, you don't vote for him. If he's good, it's eight years and he must go. Thank you, George Washington. <laughs> he decided he did not want to be the king. So I think it is a very, very good thing that this country has this, where other countries, some, have dictators and they get voted in every year. They vote, but every time it comes to a vote, they get voted in and they have the same thing for 20 years or so. And that is terrible. Yeah. But it's not a free country. And we yeah. are a free country. I, I'm going to share with the audience before I go to Tulane. Um, that um, everyone should know that 2020 was the first year that Jeanette voted as a U.S. citizen. Was, um, 
Even and, though she's been a citizen since the 1950s, this was the first time she felt an imperative to vote. Um, all right, Jeanette, we're gonna come back to you. Thank you, Lindsay. Thanks, Heidi, hang in there. Okay. And James, before we bring Tulane on, will you please play the video from South Africa? for this privilege. My investment in this project is because I love America and I want to believe in her better angels. Over more than 50 years of visiting here, I felt a deep kinship with this country because our histories are so similar. And also because we, we share a common shame. Your nation and mine became notorious as the two world capitals of white racism. My land saw 300 years of colonialism, including a century of slavery, followed by 40 years of police state brutality and racial war. In our struggle for freedom, we took immense inspiration from your struggle to live into the dream of a truly just society. And it may be now that we can share with you in return. Because time is running out for Americans of different races, to find each other. In 1963, a million people, black and white, marched to the Lincoln Memorial to say amen to a black preacher as he gave voice to their dream of a different America. How is it then that 60 years later, millions more have had to march in 200 cities, this time chanting the words of a dying man, I can't breathe. So what will it take to bring true change? Maybe Americans have trusted too much in changing the law. Of course, laws are important. Dr. King did say, the law can't make you love me, but it can stop you from lynching me. But he knew that that wasn't enough, which is why the motto of his movement was saving the soul of America. Your new president knows that too. He speaks of healing the soul of the nation. The question is, how, how, do you, how do you perform soul surgery on a nation? Well, that's what truth, justice, and reconciliation is all about. Most nations memorialize their best achievements and they bury their mistakes. But when you try to bury the kind of histories that you and I have had, they refuse to stay buried. Like toxic waste, our past seeps up again to the surface, poisoning the present and threatening our future. When South Africans became free, we looked at what the burial of past wrongs had cost other nations, including yours, and we decided to dig ours up and confront them. So we set up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Now, I like the insertion of the word justice in the project we're talking about here. TRCs don't deny justice. They do explore a realm, however, where justice and mercy coalesce, seeking transformation and restoration more than retribution. Hear me talking to you. We who believe in Thank you for that video, Tulane. And um, we're working to get Emma back from Rwanda. He's got a shaky connection. So we're going to go next uh, to you. Thank you for being so flexible, Tulane. Um, you know, you and I had a long conversation that I thought maybe we could bring up um, for our audience, and particularly after listening to that video, right? We just listened to Jeanette, mm -hmm. who is a survivor of a, of a defined, of a time-bound event in history that shook global mm -hmm. conscience. Mm -hmm. um, and afterwards, we watched what, what Germany did to acknowledge the truth as a way to restore a sense of trust between citizens in the world in the name of healing and social progress. Yeah. I would love for you to talk about how we think about concepts of truth, reconciliation, healing, justice in the US context, where there is no one violent targeted event such as the Holocaust, Rwanda, the genocide, 
but rather this several hundred year history of protract, protracted social conflict and social mm -hmm. inequity. Absolutely. Well, you know, Dr. Story in the video, he talked about, you know, South Africa and under the apartheid regime and the United States as world capitals of white supremacy. Uh, that's 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 quite a designation. And, you know, the theme or the name of this session is against forgetting. But I would offer that one of the distinct elements of systemic racism in this country, what Isabel Wilkerson calls a racial caste system, uh, is that we actually never quite got to collective remembering <laughs> or acknowledging. And one of the themes that we're hearing throughout this session is that it is critically important to tell the story. And that if you don't tell the story, the idea that you would re-architect something that is equitable, inclusive, and just, you really don't have a shot at that kind of re-architecture. And so part of what's happened in the past 12 months or so in the United States is that the story, as Dr. as Dr. Story said in this video, you know, the, the truth is emerging regardless of the sort of country's uh, collective distance from our shared history. Um, so I do believe that it's very important to put energy in the United States into uh, revealing the racial caste system and to understanding the history and the ways in which that history of a caste structure has actually perpetuated great gaps in opportunity, access, and justice, and to not treat those injustices as if they are about individual behavior um, they are about systems. They are about structures. And, you know, it was so beautiful. It was wonderful to hear Jeanette speak. And, you know, she said uh, when she was talking about the fact that our executive leaders cannot stay in those seats uh, indefinitely, she said, thank you, George Washington. Right. And I, I chuckled at that. And I said, absolutely. There's much to thank founders for. However, there was a strategic uh, shame that was part of the founding of this country. There were several, actually. The fact that I'm saying I'm in the United States as opposed to the names that Native Americans gave these lands, that the fact that we have not named and told the stories, um, that those stories are told on the fringes, is part of why we see the tensions and pain that we are wrestling with right now in the United States. Yeah. you. Um talking about sharing stories, right? And I'll put this into the chat um, toward the end. There was this remarkable study done um, by two professors, I believe at Emory in 2010, that, that said the mere telling of your origin story to your children, where are you from? Where did you meet? Where are your grandparents from? Plays a direct role in building their resilience. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then they replicated their work actually after 9 11. They went and, and interviewed all these children who had experienced this traumatic event. And, and it really bore out that those children who had been talked to over and over again about their family history proved to be more resilient because they felt like they belonged to something bigger. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd love for you to tell us more, right? When, what were you taught as a child uh, with respect to your lineage, with your story about your history that has helped you achieve success and that you put into your work now? And why do you think storytelling specifically about lineage is so important in black and brown communities today in the US? I, I love that question. Um, so there's a few dimensions. I, I am definitely, uh, you know, I am the daughters of civil rights babies. <laughs> and so, I was immersed from the time that I could perceive uh, in examples of um, Black genius. And I was immersed in stories of genius throughout the African diaspora. My father is an ethnomusicologist and a master drummer. And at a very young age in his life, he made the decision to study the culture and contributions throughout the entire African diaspora. And so I learned from a very early age that many of the delineations that we can sometimes hold so tightly to are merely byproducts of the transatlantic slave trade and patterns of colonization globally. So um, that I think is really important. It's important to know what you and your ancestors and your lineage have contributed um, and to just be and to stand firm in that. But the other piece of what I was taught that I think is equally as important, particularly in a U.S. context, is I was taught about the systemic and often state state sanctioned trauma imposed on black race identity people.
You know, I was taught and, and shown photographs of a, a tragic American tradition, lynching parties where multiple thousands of people who identified as Christians and community leaders would gather around burning black bodies. You know, mothers would put their children on their shoulders to witness. Photographers would take pictures, they called them lynching postcards, and images. People would be proud to take images next to burning black bodies, much like people would take pictures at a prom or at some public celebration or gala event. I was taught about these travesties uh, so that I would understand the systemic nature of racism in the United States. I was taught about the fact that race is basically a construct designed to advance and, and reconcile the fact that our founders loved liberty. You know, they were stepping away from the idea of divine inheritance of leadership. They loved the Lord, that most of them were professed to be Christian, but they really wanted free labor and access to a marketplace of ideas. And, and so the way that they reconciled those competing you know, belief systems is there was a systemic dehumanization of an entire group of people. Um, and I do wanna note that the other thing I was taught that matters is I was taught to understand the systemic impact of racism and the trauma that it imposed. I was also taught to understand the ways in which the story of my people um, bore similarities and connections to stories of oppression that exists across other communities and identities. I was taught that it really is about collective humanity and that there's no oppression Olympics, right? We, we, that it is actually in all of our interest to understand, study, and have empathy for what people have gone through. And that's the way we can collectively design and re-architect systems that are actually workable for all of us as opposed to a select few of us. So those are some of the lessons that I was yeah. taught when I, that's right. It's amazing listening to you. Um, you know, I, I am I'm Jew and Jewish German heritage. Uh, mm -hmm. My husband is uh, a Japanese American whose family was interned. Right. And we have that same kind. Right. This isn't a competition about who's been more oppressed over time. Right. To teach our kids this recognition about what it means to be human and what it means to be cruel. And 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 that you can't just say it's it matters here but not here. Yeah. Um, Tulane, I'm going to see if we can bring Emma in from okay. Rwanda. We lost our connection, okay. um, but let's see if we. Um, James, do we do we have Emma? Can we bring him in, or have we lost him still? I think we might have audio. I apologize to our audience. This is the the life we all live now, uh, doing everything virtually, and it is very late at night in Kigali. We're going to give this one more try. If not, I think we're going to transition over to bring in Fernando. All right, we're going to show a video um, first from Rwanda, and then we're going to see if we can at least get audio from Kigali with Emma. So let's go ahead and roll the video from Rwanda. I remember I was so, so afraid. I was like, you know what? I'm not even gonna watch my mother died or my siblings died. I'm just gonna go in the first first line. I'm just gonna be killed first. Chira jehe umone i i ukonhonje na na chivo na gachari jehe chu basha kaga urebjere tari diho basha kaga kwaba nuba ba jera jesa ku ba ba kanguri raga kuanga na ba ga kanguri ba nu kuere kaka tarumne. bareke kubika ibintu byababayeho niba bisohore babivuge babisohore be kubibika buri wese afite inzira yo musaraba ye yanyuzemo twese ziratandukanye wumva iyo ndukumvira babaje kurenza yawe ndabaha message ni basohore i would like to be called a victim 
I don't want to feel like I'm a victim of, you know, I just feel like, okay, whatever happened to me should be a motivation to make sure the genocide never happens again to anybody. Okay, no matter what horrible circumstances you may face in your life, never lose hope. Hi there, I'm going to do one more audio check to see if we have Emma. If not, I think we're going to bring for. Fernando in. Emma, you're here. Can you hear us, Emma? Emma, can you hear us? I think Emma is on a really tough connection with us this evening. Maybe we can bring in Fernando while we work with Emma on his on his connection. Hi, Fernando. Hi there. I I'm just wondering, right, if you can reflect, right, listening to Jeanette, listening to Tulane, the video, and I think you know Emma. Uh, maybe in the context of your work. Um, you can just reflect on these conversations and and talk to us, right? About there's some people they're critics, right? Of of the notion of the role of storytelling, right? That um, that it's really it, that they don't believe that it's part of the pathway to restoring trust and peace and justice. And and I'm wondering, just listening to all of what you've heard so far, plus the work that you do. Why do you think it's so critical for people to tell their stories as part of a truth and reconciliation process? Well, I think that will be easy to understand for everybody watching this uh, that hears stories of victims for the first time. And probably they are feeling things and discovering things they've never felt. And probably they will connect with the horrors of the war or dictatorship in a different way. And I think that is important by itself. Um, when we hear Jeanette or the story of Emma, that if he comes back, just let me kick me off, and then we're giving space, or it's so important to hear these small details that memory are made of. You know, Jeanette is speaking about her tattoo like a lucky number. Who have thought that about? We all have a completely different understanding of that. So I think the storytelling of the victims, it's important to understand their experiences in this uh, ho horrible, massive situations of violence. And I work for an organization, the International Center for Transitional Justice, that actually it was created by the deputy chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa as a center to bring together experiences and knowledge of what we call today transitional justice, which is basically uh, the different processes that we put in place that we design, that we implement to deal with the consequences of massive human rights violations. And I think truth is important. It is very important for everybody to know what did happen after a war or a dictatorship, the narrative that has been created. It never includes Janet's version or probably Enma's version or people who suffered slavery in the United States. So those stories have to be complementing and completing the, the narrative that those countries have created often to hide the crimes and the victims. So that is so crucial that I think everybody who has worked with victims or heard the story of victims would understand immediately how important it is. But if I just may say, I would say that is just not enough. Uh, I think that the, the storytelling by itself is crucial, but it requires also the acknowledgement of the society. It, it needs victims to be acknowledged by the society to recognize that those things shouldn't have happened. And it also requires that victims uh, get reparations from what they suffer, from what they've lost, and also different ways of accountability that sometimes comes on criminal accountability, but sometimes comes on different ways from memorialization to also reparations. And of course, a lot of reforms and changes in the state to, as Jeanette said, as others have said, 
things don't happen again. And that is what we try to do in the International Center for Transitional Justice, working in many, many countries, including this one. So we're going to bring the whole panel in, but one of the questions that's come up in the chat, you just answered one about reparations. Um, when we bring in our other speakers, maybe you can um, answer the, this, and then we'll ask Jeanette, and we'll ask Tulane. Um, Fernando first, then the Jeanette, because the question came in specifically to you about forgiveness. How do you forgive when something so horrible has happened to you? Fernando, maybe you can start with what you've observed in post-conflict countries, and then we'll go to Jeanette, and she can talk a little bit about forgiveness. I, I, I'd i say that, um, I personally don't think we should be talking about forgiveness. I think that is a very personal choice. I think we need to talk about reconciliation, understanding by that, the restoring of trust among people, among individuals, and also with the state and with the institutions. I think the forgiveness, it, it, it might touch with your uh, religious beliefs or with your personal way of healing, but I think the reconciliation process that doesn't include forgiveness by itself, it needs to repair and restore the social contract that has been destroyed by the violation. So that reconciliation, sometimes it's very individual and personal uh, for the person to heal. Sometimes it's with the person with their peers at a horizontal level with their community if there has been like in rwanda killing each other or neighbors have been killing each other but many many times it's also your relationship with the state what is your trust on the state and can you trust the institutions that have committed violations of course not if they don't change and there is no some level of accountability so i think that is a multi-layer process that takes a lot of time and includes legal reforms that we heard in the video but also cultural changes and cultural uh, mindsets ch changes on the mindset and of course personal and individual uh processes thank you jeanette heidi the question came in from the audience about forgiveness and someone in the audience specifically asked about how you learned to forgive after something so horrible happened to you and your whole family was murdered? Uh, how, so it's about forgiveness. Yeah. And how do you learn to forgive? I think... I cannot forgive that they killed my parents. Or your sister. Or my sister. Mm -hmm. Or my aunt and uncle and that I was the only one survivor from the whole, from my father was four with families, my mother three, and with everybody with children, and I am the only survivor. And, and that is very difficult to forgive that they shot my mother and that she had to dig her own grave and sit back so they see you. Uh, can, can we just mention about my mother decided my mother has nothing against other people who want reparations my mother even when she had nothing and was offered reparations refused reparations because nothing could she refused to make that their blood should, the blood of her family should ever be. There is no way to erase what did they, they did. Did they think they could buy me off that my, shot my parents for $4,000? Not for 40 million would I want to for that. But she doesn't hold it. She knows what's right for her. And she doesn't, and doesn't interfere with what might be right for somebody else. Somebody else feels reparations no, is right for them. Oh, That's definitely. Somebody feels the world is so different. That yeah, is, it's. Is, I, I cannot forgive them that they killed my mother and father. I, can, I could forgive them that they took everything that we had the stores and my nice good living. I can forgive that, but I cannot forgive for killing my mother and father or my sister 
or the rest yeah. of the family. Yeah, Jeanette, thank you. Heidi, thank you. It's interesting, there are a lot of questions in the chat about reparations and Tulane, maybe this is a good place to bring you in. You're spending a lot of time um, with a number of people all over the country, thought leaders who, who really are grappling with how do we even start to envision what truth and reconciliation looks like in the US context and reparations is always a, a, a topic that comes up. So I'd, I'd love your opinion on, on reparations, on forgiveness, on all these different notions that are, um, these are heavy concepts that are deeply personal. And yet also people are, you know, as Fernando said, right, it goes from the very, very personal, Jeanette just shared that, all the way up to a systems design for a nation. Is that a question to me? No, it's to Tulane. Jeanette? Um, so wonderful to hear you today. So I think part of what, when I think about reparations in the US, I mean, one, that term certainly in the United States, but not only here, has been so, it's so been so politicized and so misunderstood. And, and you know, one of the challenges is the, what we mean by that word, depending on who you're talking to. Is it about access to cash? Is it about access to education? You know, is it about land ownership? What does it really mean? How does it connect to the land back movement in the Native American community? So I think one thing that is important to consider is the notion of repair. And there's actually an incredible organization that I've had the privilege of working with uh, called Liberation Ventures that has built an entire framework around repair that acknowledges that part of what we need in the United States certainly is the capacity to acknowledge the collective trauma that has been part of systemic racism. And what do, what are the phases of recovering from trauma? We know this as human beings, it doesn't change based on your racial identity. You know, step one is there has to be safety and stability. So whatever it is that is causing you uh, harm has to be stopped. That's step one. We haven't actually gotten there yet in the United States for people of color. You know, in 2020, the first eight months of 2020 alone, over 160 black people were killed by police. So we're not, it's not over. It's not, it's not something you can totally look back to. There's been incredible progress, right? However, there are still systemic norms that mean that the lives of people of color in this country are at greater risk. The infant mortality rates in Black communities are much higher and compared to countries that have much less resource around healthcare. So first, uh, safety and stability. We're not quite there yet. Then we have to really look at remembering and grieving. And there's not much space in the US context for collective remembering and grieving. Most people don't really even know about reconstruction. A lot of people don't know about American traditions around lynching. If you talk to many Americans about you know, Jim Crow, Many people don't know that in the not too distant history, this country had an essentially an apartheid structure. Dr. Story recognized it as somebody who was leading change across the ocean. But in this country, there's been a collective, um, not forgetting, but just uh, erasing of that history. So I think it's important to pay attention to the collective trauma. And we know as human beings what we need when we're navigating trauma. We need to ensure safety. We need to remember and grieve. And the third step is we need to restore relationships. And I think often in this country, we go right to step three. We go right to relationships and treat it as if it's solely about connection, but it's actually about systems and healing. And so I think it's important for us to figure out what does that look like? And then through that process of healing and addressing trauma, then we're in a place where we can even consider what restoration, repair, and perhaps reparations look like. But we're skipping a lot of steps, I find. Yeah. And States. It's a great, it's a great answer. And we're going to try to bring Emma back in. I think we, we may have uh, restored our signal here. If we can get Emma, it's a perfect segue to him. There he is. Emma, can you hear us? Emma, can you hear us? I'm so sorry we can't get him in. He has such an incredible story to share about the process of healing in Rwanda and his role in this. Jeanette, I'm going to ask you another question. And then if we get Emma's connection working, we'll also ask it to him. There's a question that came 
Jeanette, there's a question that came about old people and young people working together. And how do you think the best way for old people and young people to work together around things like peace and getting rid of hate? Peace and get rid of hate. Yeah, no, I believe in this and that it would be very, very good. But I personally want to be left out of that. <laughs> no, well, do you want, don't you think the young, I, I, well, that's not what she said. Okay. <laughs> no, I. When I know that your grandson, your grandchildren are a big part of your life. And how do you think your experience has affected them? How do you how, how, it's not translating, it's all English. <laughs> how, how do you think that your experience has affected the way your grandchildren are? Is that right? It, it should, it affected mostly my daughter because I was so mad that when Eichmann, when the trial of Eichmann was, she was about six years, how old were you? What, oh, the Eichmann trial was in um, like 61. I must, must have been like four or five, four, four or five years. That I, I took her. And I put her on the couch and I said, sweetheart, just watch that. That is the meanest man in the world. There was one who was worse, but he's, his name was Hitler, but he's dead. And she watched. She is, today she's uh, 62. No, I'm 64. 64. <laughs> Very few people who watch the Iceman trial. So, but what all her grandchildren, ha because of her life, happen to be involved in social justice issues. And yeah, I mean, everything from that is, my nephew yeah. who during the immigration crisis, he went to the airport that, and he was helping the Muslims get through that to make sure that Trump could not, you know, he's everyone. My, my son happens to be one of the heads of the Sunrise Movement. Uh, it's. And so yeah, every, one, every grandchild, it is another, one, another one works for uh, children with disabilities. And so six grandchildren, six highly involved. So when I hear about young people not being involved, I'm saying, where are those young people? We only know ones who feel the, that they were so lucky, the privilege, that they were born into privilege of what shouldn't that they shouldn't have even been here and because of her making it and so they all feel they owe <laughs> i no. see emma again we're gonna try emma can you hear us emma Fernando, one of the questions that we have, and maybe if, if Emma can hear us, we'll we'll give it a try to right, is about it's building on, on what Jeanette just shared. It's about intergenerational trauma um, and intergenerational justice building, right? So where do you see examples of intergenerational trauma in the work that you've done? And where do you see examples of intergenerational healing that are models that could be applied in other contexts? It's, uh, there are so many important topics that we could speak for another hour in this particular, just to take the conversation somewhere else, because unfortunately, we have so many genocides beyond uh, the Holocaust or Rwanda, and we've seen concentration camps in the Balkans, and we've seen them in Syria recently. So uh, there are so many waters that, of course, 
there are prota protracted conflicts that takes decades. And then we can see that in many, many countries. So just one example we're working with in Lebanon that it's been clearly affecting the youth now that they haven't been experiencing the war, but they are still experiencing the consequences and the impact of the war. And because Lebanon applied a self, an official self amnesia with the peace agreement that they uh, signed in 1991, and there are still warlords among the establishment and in positions of power, then we, put, for instance, in the, in, in the ICTJ, we um, supported a, a project of intergener intergenerational dialogue of grandsons and granddaughters interviewing their grandparents and getting their experiences from the war and understanding that everything that they heard about it, it was actually in their own family. And for many, it was the first time they spoke about it. So you can see how this amnesia, this taboo that is created in a society, it goes over and over and over in generation, which shapes the society in a, in, in a way. It does, it's a society that at the end of the day doesn't endorse accountability, that doesn't endorse the suffering of others. And we start, start, start living with kind of a stigma Victims have this stigma that they cannot speak. So the Balkans can be another one, and Lebanon, they can be, they can be um, the one that I mentioned, and many others. So I think this work, this intergenerational work that Janet and her family are talking about is crucial. And the role of youth and groups of people that are not necessarily um, human rights activists, but they are related to education, to faith groups, to a sport association, that they can go into the conversation to approach this from a way that is purely uh, humanitarian. Um, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. That's what, yeah. Uh, Tulane, I'm interested in your take on this question about intergenerational um, work. Um, I think we're seeing this remarkable moment in the US mm -hmm. um, of both you know, to the theme of the whole Skull World Forum about bridging the gap, right? Bridging the divide, right? There are these moments where you're seeing um, remarkable connection between generations, mm -hmm. uh, particularly those who were raised in the civil rights area and see what, you know, this. But then there are also these fissures. There's fissure around solution, around acknowledgement, around language, right? Help me, you know, how do you see this in the U.S. context? Where's the real opportunity for intergenerational uh, work? Yeah, I think I, I love that, you know, um, uh, a mentor of mine once said, like, if you want to, you know, Tulane, if you want to be part of changing an organization or a system, you have two pathways. One is that you have to help people understand how to change within the story they tell themselves uh, about who they are, or you get them to change the story that they're telling about who they are. Powerful um, results of intergenerational coalitions is that I find that young folks. And you know, you know, there's, they're not monolithic, right? But for the most part, young folks are willing to change the story that they're telling, right? And that that enables real systems change. And so I think it's really important that when we work across generations, that you know, those who are elders, I actually want to honor my grandmother, Luella Lee, who recently transitioned. She recently passed away. Sorry. And Yes, thank you so much. And she, um, so she's now an ancestor and she would tell me and my family stories about her life and what she had been through. And so what it enabled me to do uh, is that it enabled me to understand what it took to create certain resources that were just a given in my life. And I think that that kind of information sharing across generations is key because then when you have the not just the energy, but the boldness and clarity that young people so often bring into change making, they are armed with the information about what it took to get where we are now. And then that, I believe, is a way that generations can actually accelerate change uh, in a way that we can't do with just one generation by itself. There's something about the intersectional, intergenerational work that's so exciting to me. And I think the challenge is to not get so caught up in the way we say what we think that we stop listening to each other. So I think a lot about that. Thank you. I have one, I think, one last question for each of you. Um, and it's a question I asked uh, this morning at the beginning of the Skull World Forum to former presidents, uh, Sir Leaf and uh, Zadio. And the question is about hope 
and optimism. Uh, we were all talking before the session, right, about I'm, I'm sort of pathologically positive. So I, I always like to end these sessions, uh, particularly um, one where people are so generous and sharing about terrible things that have happened in their lives or that they've observed, uh, about what, what continues to bring you hope. Um, so maybe we'll go in the order of uh, Fernando, Tulane, and then we'll let Jeanette finish for us about what makes you feel hopeful these days um, in our society? Um, sometimes it's a difficult question uh, to find that hope uh, in the middle of everything. But I, I think that uh, working on this sometimes when we are, when we are talking about uh, violations and suffering and victims and injustices all over, it's very difficult to feel hope. But I think it's important to many, many times open the perspective and see from a, a little bit from higher just to see the processes. And then we can see that progress. We can see that we are doing things that were unthinkable years ago. And then we have opportunities that were unthinkable and openings that didn't exist ago. And that, that is where we have to be hopeful and energetic. And then personally, I've been working with victims for 25 years. And sometimes, of course, it's, it's hard, but I always felt that if they don't give up, neither we should. Uh, and we, we have to be working for them and with them just to bring the justice that it's been denied to so many. And also, as they've been said, that it's been said here, to prevent this to happening again anywhere in the world. And that is what is really the motivation and what I think it brings hope. Thank you. I love that answer. Tulane? Yeah, there's a few things. Um, I, when I look at it, and this, it's, you know, it's been a, a, a rough year, <laughs> a lot of pain and a lot of pain, uh, for a lot of us, but certainly, you know, um, the, the pain of systemic racism has become uh, evident in a way that it wasn't for many people who live uh, in this country and all over the world. But I'll say this, um, there's hope for me in the fact that conversations that at one point, not too long ago, were happening, you know, only in homes, um, or in small groups quietly on the side, that these conversations, telling the stories and uh, you know naming what is unacceptable in terms of systemic racism, that these have become uh, dominant conversations, that we are now having these conversations in public spaces, that I can be on a, a, a platform like this and talk about the things that we're talking about. And I'm not having to make the case or convince anybody listening or watching that systemic racism is real and uh, deeply problematic for any you know, aspiring modern democracy. So there is a case making that was required just you know, arguably even a year ago here in the United States around the pervasiveness and devastation of racism that um, is no longer required. And so now that we're not spending our precious energy case making, we can now go into re-architecting. And so I actually take hope in that. Um, and I know we have to continually soothe and heal ourselves from the impact of perpetual trauma. And yet if we do that and do that wisely, we actually, it's like the universe is cracked open. Things that were not discussable are being discussed and resisted and redesigned right now. Like we're living right now in the moment where this level of change is actually possible in a way that it didn't feel like it was just a, a year ago. Thank you. And Jeanette and Heidi, we have one more minute. And if you want to end the session for us with something that you feel hopeful about, we would love that. And we just wanted to thank you so much. And Heidi, thank you so much for helping with everything today. So what do you feel hopeful about? What makes you feel hopeful for the future? I am hopeful that we now have, like, we can vote for a president if he's not good, we, next time we wouldn't vote for him. I'm, I feel that it's good. Everything goes towards easier, away from where people had to do certain things. We can do what we want and nobody will, uh, will tell us no. And I feel that is in this country, I don't know how it is now in Europe, but definitely better than it was under Hitler. Thank you. 
um, this whole panel, all of you, this has been an amazing, uh, amazing time together. We can't thank you enough on behalf of our audience for your time. And Jeanette, I love, I love getting to talk to you. It makes me miss my grandparents so much every time I hear your voice. You're a real gift to all of us. Um, and I also wanted to thank our partners at the Showa Foundation for introducing us to you um, and for the videos. To our audience who joined us today, thank you so much for listening and for questions, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the Skull World Forum. Take care. <laughs>